Well, greetings, viewers, voyeurs, and welcome. You're with Got That Funk. Thanks for joining me. As many of you are probably aware, um, a few weeks ago on YouTube, The Peach, the one and only, uh, made a video for the first time in quite a long time. And I was delighted to see more uh, product from Peach on the, the old tubes here. And in the comment section to her video, I mentioned that I intend to start making videos more often on my own channel as well. And since she made that video, she also had the same intention, but so far, uh, zip. So I thought I would do an old-fashioned tag video. And one of the people I'm going to tag in this video is the Peach. And partly that is because way, way back when I had like a couple of dozen subscribers, um, Peach tagged me uh, for the first, she was the first person to ever tag me back when tag videos were more of a thing on YouTube. And it was to sing a song, which I sang a song by Prince, and, you know, it's fair to say that I murdered that song. But, uh, you know, I sing like a cat, and that's just the way it is. Anyway, so Peach and I go back to pretty much our earliest days on YouTube, the two of us. I think she started making videos like a week or two before I did in 2009. Anyway, so Peach, consider yourself tagged for this video. This is a basic show-and-tell video, okay? This is a video about treasures, the things that you bring with you that you keep throughout your life. Now, as I've mentioned once or twice before on my channel on YouTube, I am or have been in my past uh, a hoarder. Uh, when I started making videos in 2009, I was pretty much at peak hoard, as it were. Uh, the flat I lived in with my son back in those days uh, had stuff crammed into every nook and corner. Right. Uh, honestly, I, I had collections of things that had no value, but I just collected them because I personally thought they had value, even though they really don't to anybody but me. And, you know, when I was single and stuff, uh, you know, towed my hoard around with me, didn't really encumber me or bother me much. In fact, it sort of gave me a little sense of comfort. I think that's why people hoard it in the first place. But then when I moved in with my girlfriend in 2011, uh, obviously she didn't have the space for all my junk and I threw like 95% of my hoard away. Um, but there are certain things that are keepsakes that I will keep until either they are uh, no longer usable or I will just keep them forever, uh, depending. Um, because not only, are, it's, it's not about hoarding, it's, it's about mementos, it's about uh, points in your life uh, and people in your life that made a big difference and uh, keeping things from those people that, uh, you know, uh, can make can ma certain matters to me. Now, for the people I tag in this video, you don't have to be showing me your treasures of things that people gave you necessarily. It just so happens that four out of the five things that I'm going to share with viewers today are things that were given to me by someone else. Um, and I find it interesting, in fact, when I was deciding what to put in this video, what not to put in this video, that, uh, yeah, most of the things that I treasure the most, I just didn't really make the connection until today, uh, are things that were given to me by someone. So I guess that means that the, the, the virtue of someone having given me a, a gift and the thought behind the gift ma matters more to me than maybe I properly acknowledged or realized. Anyway, so number five on my list, and this is really in no particular order except for the last thing I'm going to show you, which definitely is my favorite of the five. But so number five is this. This is an hourglass, obviously, and it takes exactly 60 minutes for the sand to fall all the way through. That hourglass was given to me by my uh, second wife's mother for a wedding present when we got married in 2001. And it's significant to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, ever since I was a kid and I used to watch The Wizard of Oz, I've always liked hourglasses. Um, because if you've obviously ever seen the movie, um, Dorothy's trapped in the castle and the witch has an hourglass and when the sand runs out, it's her time is up sort of thing. But I always wanted an hourglass that lasted exactly an hour. Uh, you know, so often you see little hourglasses, but the, you know, they're for like three minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. And I wanted an hour long hourglass, but I didn't have the first idea where to sort of look for that kind of thing. And this is before you could buy everything on the internet. You know, I, I mentioned it to my girlfriend's mother when we were visiting her in Wales in 1997. We went up there for Christmas that year. And uh, 
I mentioned just in passing what I just said to you that I've always had a thing about hourglasses and how I always wished I had an hourglass that lasted 60 minutes and so forth. Never mentioned it again. And when I did mention it, you know, uh, everybody was feeling pretty merry with the Christmas spirit, if you take my meaning. Uh, so, yeah, the, then like four years later, when me and her daughter got married, uh, I was delighted to find this hourglass wrapped for me in a box. So not only did I get something I had always wanted, which really I thought was pretty special in itself, but the fact is I mentioned it just randomly once four years previous, and she kept that in her mind the whole time and then gave it to me for a wedding present. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, number four on my, my list here, this is a, you might think, treasure, Paul, really? You are a hoarder still. Anyway, it's this. Uh, I recently wore this to work, so it's a bit dirty, but this is a t-shirt. World Cup USA 1994. This is from the uh, Chicago venue. I was born in Chicago, and um, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, uh, who was still alive at that time, uh, saw the shirt in a shop and bought it for me and sent it to me here in the UK. So that shirt is 24 years old, almost exactly, because it's World Cup time coming up again soon. Anyway, and uh, that's the only thing I have uh, from my paternal grandmother. It's the only gift that I think she might have ever given me since, uh, you know, the early 1970s. So as an adult, this was like the first and only thing I ever got from her. And the fact that it's a World Cup USA t-shirt, uh, I, I think is kind of cool as well, because uh, obviously European people in particular take the piss out of the United States when it comes to our prospects for ever, ever, ever getting a victory in the World Cup. I personally have gone on record as saying that we will definitely win a World Cup in the USA no later than the year 2030. I'm thinking it's probably more like 2026, especially if the USA gets to host the games. Um, but we will see. Anyway, uh, so there's that. There's that. That that T-shirt I have. Uh, once it's once once a garment of mine goes past 20 years old, I consider it more or less expendable. So I do wear that to work. Whereas once upon a time, I used to treat it with a bit more care. Even so, this this thing is tough as old leather. Honestly, it's <laughs> it's gone through the motions. It must have been washed like about 200 times over the past 24 years. All right, uh, number three, continuing with a grandparent theme. I got these as a gift from my mother. Uh, they used to belong to her parents. This is for my grandparents, my maternal grandparents' wedding set. Uh, this is a pink wine glass and a pink champagne glass. And I don't know if you can see the etching on the champagne glass, but it's pretty special. And this one's obviously beveled, so it looks pretty cool. And each one of these uh, is, you know, what, my grandparents got married in 1938, put it that way, so I guess they're about 80 years old now. And they're irreplaceable and therefore priceless as far as I'm concerned. I've got a pair of each of those. My sister's got a pair of each of those. My brother's got a pair of each of those. And my mom's got a pair of each of those. Um, so the, the actual service has been split up so that everybody could have a little bit. But I absolutely treasure them. I almost never drink out of them. And when I do, I am extremely careful. Right. Uh, penultimately on this list is something that I bought for myself. Um, this is like, I think about last year, I w there's a record shop in a town that I used to work in uh, on a construction site nearby the, the record shop and I happened to see the shop and it's one of these shops that are almost completely like gone from the face of the earth. When you walk in the door, it's literally like records piled from the floor all the way to the ceiling and I'm not kidding, on every wall and on all the racks, floor almost all the way to the ceiling, he must have 10,000 records in this little tiny shop. And uh, many of them are brought, by, brought there by collectors and he sells them on, on a sell or return basis. And this is one of those. Uh, someone had brought their album collection in. They're like, you know, I'm never gonna listen to these records again, see what you can get for them for me. And I was lucky enough to get this. Show you the back side. Now, if you don't know what that record is, there it is at the bottom. The Jimi Hendrix Experience, Electric Ladyland. Finding that in the original cover, which that is, uh, is nigh on impossible. And I just happened to be in the record shop on the right day. It's that simple. And if my house was on fire, 
I seriously might come in and try and save that record, along with my Prince albums and stuff, of course. But that Jimi Hendrix record, it, 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 that's, Electric Ladyland, for those of you who don't know, is probably the most influential rock album ever that wasn't made by the Beatles. That's, you know, you know it, over Dark Side of the Moon, over anything else I can think of, really. Um, Electric Ladyland um, inspired an awful lot of people on the guitar, first of all. And the other musicians of the day, you know, like Jimmy Page, for example, or uh, George Harrison and uh, others, Pete Townsend, used to go and watch Jimi Hendrix play in awe of the man. And for good reason. Electric Ladyland is a double album, came out in 1968, and there literally is not another record that sounds anything close to like it. So yeah, I, I will treasure that forever. And uh, not quite so much, though, as I have treasured this. This is a little pamphlet. See? Thoughts for Paul Allen. This was given to me back in 1980 by my ex-girlfriend's mother. It's beautiful handwriting of hers throughout. And it's a collection of poetry and psalms and uh, uh, other prose, basically. Um, and even though I had broken up with her daughter and broke her daughter's heart, she, or her whole family for that matter, uh, sort of took me in, took me seriously, um, and gave me reasons to, you know, want to be a good person. They were the family that introduced me to Christianity uh, back in the day. Uh, I have a video on this channel called My Salvation Moment. And that video pretty much sums up uh, how I first came to Christianity. And uh, I was a young man. I was only 18 at the time uh, that we were dating. And when we split up, I think my girlfriend's mother, she knew that I was a, you know, a decent, guy, decent guy still trying to find himself and figure himself out and you know, find my place in the world and so on. And this lovely pamphlet full of uh, prose you see that um, there's so much this comes from such a place of love and respect and hope and I did want to share a couple of the things in here now some of these are samples about you know if you don't know how to pray properly like I was brand new to the faith at the time and some of these are basically like uh, prayers that you might want to use or emulate and and so forth but um, there's two in particular two bits in here that she's written for me that I really wanted to share because they have totally been responsible in part I suppose not totally but these this really affected my life this really gave me something to sort of cling on to from a moral standpoint and and try to aim for and as I was carving out my individual uh, identity as a young man uh, it's not an exaggeration to say I turned to these pages many times because I knew they came from a good place and from a good person. Now there's one here I want to read real quick called Answered Prayer. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need to, of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life so that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed man that has like so much to do with how I have approached my life as an adult um, that one phrase I asked for all things that I might enjoy life and I was given life that I might enjoy all things when the first time when I read that it was like a light came on in the back of my head and I thought that is exactly right you know it's uh, to, to, to quote Cheryl Crow it's not having what you want it's wanting what you have you know, valuing life and, and, and valuing the happiness that you can find in life is much more important than having a lot of stuff. 
There's another one here I wanted to share really quickly. This one, oh, that last one was written by an unknown Confederate soldier, apparently. And this one is a, a short piece by Leonard Wagner. It's called Manhood. The world needs men who cannot be bought, whose word is their bond, who put character above wealth, who are larger than their vocations, who do not hesitate to take chances, who will not lose their identity in a crowd, who will be as honest in small things as in large, who will make no compromise with wrong, whose ambitions are not confined to their own selfish desires, who will not say they do it because everyone else is doing it, who are true to their friends though good report through good report and evil report, adversity as well as prosperity, who do not believe that shrewdness and cunning are the best qualities for winning success, who are not ashamed to stand with the truth when it is unpopular, who can say no with emphasis, although the rest of the world says yes. God, make me this kind of man. Again, that really had an impact. It, it, to, to me, it's the right message at the right moment in your life it can make all the difference. And uh, Nancy, if you ever see this video, I want to thank you sincerely. I hope it means something to you that I've kept this all this time. And I hope you understand how much I appreciate. Even though uh, we were ships in the night in terms of uh, the intersection of our lives, the bottom line is uh, you, your daughter, your husband, and your son as well for that matter, but mostly the others, really helped me through a difficult point in my life and set me on a good trajectory. I've enjoyed my life a great deal and an awful lot of the reason I was able to enjoy it the way I have is down to some of the lessons that I got in that pamphlet. So thank you. Listen everybody, thank you for coming along for the ride. I know this has been a long video, but I hope it's been worth it for you. I'm going to be making more videos on this channel now. Um, now that I've got a much better place to live, much more headspace and so forth. Um, I'll be giving you a little tour of my new place in my next video. And until then, thanks for watching. Be kind to yourself.